The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, I'm Guy from IT Masters and welcome to week two of the VMware vSphere 6 Masterclass short course facilitated by IT Masters and Information Technology Professionals Association or ITPA and presented by your mentor Robert Hudson. Today Robert will be speaking about virtual networking and how to incorporate networking into your labs if you haven't already. Uh, as always send in your questions via the chat function on GoToWebinar and we'll try to get as many as possible. Uh, please note, however, that due to the advanced nature of this course relative to some of our other free short courses, questions not relevant to the content will probably not be addressed. Uh, if you have questions that you need answered, uh, drop a line in the forums at the learn.itmasters.edu.au page. There are hundreds of fellow students that might be able to answer it and we look at the forums too, so, so I'm sure you'll be able to get a hand if you need it. Um, and in any case, they're just a great tool just for collaborative learning. Anyway. Uh, not much for me this week, so thanks so very much for coming in again, and please welcome Robert. Good evening, or good afternoon, or good morning to you all, depending on where you are located. Uh, welcome to our week two webinar, which is on virtual networking. So as you can see, we've done week one, we've crossed that off, done, dusted. If you did miss the webinar, uh, we have recorded it, as Guy mentioned, there was a, a pair of links on the learn.itmasters.edu.au site. One is a uh, YouTube link and the other is a link that you can actually download the MP4 file for offline viewing. This week we are looking at virtual networking. Um, I have posted and it has been posted twice and also I have made a forum post that the knowledge that is assumed for this week is that you have some understanding of the basics of networking or computer networking in general. That if I ask you at what layer does a frame exist versus a packet, um, where would you find a MAC address versus an IP address, uh, and at what layer do the operations of switching and routing occur, if you do not know they are layer 2 and layer 3 respectively for each of those pairings, then you may struggle this week. And I would suggest that feel free to sit and watch the webinar, pick up what you can, go back and do some learning and then watch a recording of the webinar because you will pick up more and understand more if you have a, a good understanding of those networking basics. Without further ado, however, we will get on to the content this week. So, we are looking this week at virtual networking as I've already mentioned. So we have a, a quick overview of what is a virtual switch, uh, what are the components that make up a virtual switch and we Someone's getting some echo, I hope that's not me. I'll try to keep it cleaner. Um, we will look at... It's all good at mine. But, um, okay. Look, but, in, yeah, in general, guys, if you're seeing some error issues with the audio or hearing some errors with the audio, obviously, do make a note um, and then we'll get... If something is happening funny, then Guy will be able to comment as a remote attendee on whether he's seeing it. If he's not, generally what that means is that the issue is at your end. I hate to be the one to say it, but unfortunately a lot of the issues will be at your end. Um, not always, but that's just the way things tend to go on these things. So, yeah. and, and, and we recommend that if, if that is the case, um, just a quick log on, log off might actually fix the problem. And if you have ongoing problems, maybe just look for the lecture recording. Yeah, the, the standard Microsoft response of control alt delete sometimes does help too. <laughs> um, <laughs> we shall move on back to the content. So we are going to look at um, the two different or the two main types of v-network switches which are standard and distributed switches uh, and look at some of the differences. Uh, I have moved the microphone away a little. Uh, Nathaniel, sorry for that. So we're going to look at the standard and distributed v-network switches. What types, uh, what, what the differences are between those two types of switches. We're going to look at some advanced network settings and their importance. Um, they are generally grouped around the ideas of security settings. So some of the settings you can set on your virtual switches to enhance or uh, perform security actions. A look at NIC teaming and load balancing, what the two of those terms mean and how they interoperate with each other. Some, some issues or some options around network failover detection and the actions you, you, your virtual switches may take around that. And we are also going to look at some traffic shaping. Uh, and those are really the, the things we'll look at. We will also look um, to a point at then what you might want to include in your lab. 
when you do your lab work this week. Okay, so a virtual switch overview. So virtual switches, just like physical switches, are, are really made up of a, a number of components. Now, in a physical switch, and if you have any understanding of, of general layer two switching, and I mentioned before the, the terms layer two and switching and packets and frames and things like that will get mentioned regularly this week. So a, a switch is, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, a multi-point repeater, again, or a multi-port repeater. If you go back and read my networking primer, you'll see some of those terms mentioned. And a switch's purpose is really to, to receive a frame on one port and forward that frame to another. And that's all they do. They operate at layer two, as I mentioned. The addressing scheme used at layer two is the MAC address. So, in a virtual switch, we build port groups, and the closest analogy you'll get to that in physical switching would probably probably be VLANs. So port groups are logical groupings of virtual ports which share functionality and configuration, not just VLANs in virtual networking, but some other things as well. Those port groups are made of virtual ports, as those virtual ports can have different types. The two main types you'll look at and there are some funny ones if you start looking at distributed vSwitches, are virtual machine ports. So virtual machine ports are the network ports that your virtual machines have built into them to talk to your network. You then have VM kernel ports. Now a VM kernel port is different in that a VM kernel port is used for ESXi itself, so the hypervisor, the underlying uh, host under your virtual machines, to perform network operations. And there's a, a distinct difference in the two. The virtual machine ports are purely used for virtual machines to communicate either with, with each other or the outside world, the area of your environment outside of your virtualization platform. VM kernel ports are used for ESXi itself to perform network operations. So you will see things like iSCSI, if your virtual hosts are connecting to their block level storage through iSCSI, that is generally done through a VM kernel port. Operations such as vMotion, where one virtual host sends the contents of a virtual machine to another, that is done through VM kernel ports. And also your management traffic for your host. So when you connect to your host, either when vCenter manages it, or if you connect to it directly using you know, any of the, the numerous clients, uh, which includes SSH, if you go into the command line, the vSphere client through either vCenter or directly, the embedded ESXi web client, all that traffic runs through your VM kernel port, which is your management port. You do not, on standard network switches, and it's a little bit different on distributed virtual network switches, configure ports directly on vSwitches. Ports are dropped into port groups, which is where your configuration is done. But generally, you, on a standard vNetwork switch, you do not configure individual ports. On a distributed vSwitch, that can be a bit different. Now, the other kind of port on a vSwitch is a physical port, an uplink port. This is the point between which your virtual environment uh, and your physical environment communicate. And on the next slide, you will see, and we'll get to some of this in a minute, so your, your virtual machine port groups. So on this example, and this is a standard document taken, or a standard image taken out of some of the VMware documentation, uh, they have broken their virtual machine port groups into three, a production port group, a test and dev port group, and a DMZ port group. And on each of those groups, different rules will be applied. And we'll get to what some of those rules are later, but you know, in summary, uh, you, you might have different VLANs on them, you might have different MTUs set on them, multiple uh, maximum transmission unit size of the the frame that the switch will forward in, in one go rather than splitting it up. There's some other uh, aspects we'll get to in a moment, but there's certainly the two most common things that would be configured in a port group. You then have your VM kernel ports, and I note that whoever at VMware put this document together spelt VM kernel wrong, it should be spelt EL at the end, not AL. So those are, again, your management port, which I mentioned, and your vMotion port, and it could be other traffic, fiber channel over Ethernet or iSCSI, are also performed on VM kernel ports. Again, your VM kernel ports are the ports that ESXi itself uses for its operations. Your virtual machine port groups are ports, or your ports in your virtual machine port groups are used by virtual machines themselves, not the host. 
So at no stage would you connect to a virtual manage, uh, management port that was in a virtual machine port group. That doesn't work that way. Now the uplink Um, so port groups, one you can have one port in a port group. So you can, in theory, configure a port group that contains a single port and configure that one port. The configuration is not done against the port though, it's done against the port group. And sorry to clarify, the question asked was, if a port group is made of two or more ports in, in, in a switch, can I configure a single switch port, a virtual port in a port group? So yes. Uh, someone has asked, what is a DMZ or demilitarized zone? Generally, it's a segment of the network that you don't trust. Uh, it tends to be an area where you might put services that you allow public internet access or public access via the internet to, and therefore you have a lower level of trust of the workloads that communicate via that DMZ. So you may actually apply different uh, firewall rules or different routing policies to ports in those groups. iSCSI connections, if it's a VM kernel port group, iSCSI connections in that sense are for the iSCSI connections to the hosts for storage. You can, and there's nothing to stop you, creating a virtual machine port group that goes into the same VLAN as your iSCSI storage and directly connecting your virtual machines to iSCSI storage. That is possible. Uh, someone has asked, how do you identify the uh, port group v VLANs? You configure them in, in the port group configuration. I'll get to that in a moment. How many uplink ports are there? As many as you have physical ports that you decide to connect to that virtual switch. The topology is independent of the hardware manufacturer. So this is a, and this is one of the powers of virtualization. It allows you to abstract the virtual configuration you have from the physical topology that sits underneath it. Now I'm going to move on guys. Um, I don't want to get into too much depth on this. Again, we only have an hour to go through a fairly large topic. So, I mentioned before, there were two types of vNetwork switches, standard and distributed. I'm not going to, and I'll, I'll mention this now, there are uh, distributed vNetwork switches that are produced by third parties, such as the Cisco 1000V. I'm not talking about them in this course. That's above the, the level at which we're going to go into, or below the level into which we're going to delve in this course. So, we go to our vNetwork standard switches. So, as you'll see here, we have three hosts. Each host has its own vNetwork standard switch. Uh, they're independent. Each one of those v -network switch, those standard vNetwork switches has some VM kernel ports and they may be used for different functionalities such as management and iSCSI. I mentioned that earlier. They may then have vir virtual machine port groups which will have operating systems within the virtual machines and applications inside of those and they will connect them to a virtual switch and at the physical layer, you will see there are each one of these hosts has four network cards, four physical NICs or PNICs, we sometimes refer, refer to them as, and they are all connected to those, physical, those switches. What you will notice is that effectively the configuration on each host is independent of the configuration on any other host. When you start looking at some of the advanced features such as HA, which then relies on vMotion, DRS, which also relies on vMotion, um, so HA doesn't necessarily rely on vMotion so much because HA tends to be when a host has gone down and the virtual machine is brought up, but DRS certainly relies on vMotion. The, the configuration has to be consistent across these hosts in order for a virtual machine to happily migrate from one host to another. If you have a virtual switch configuration on host one that has a different uh, port group name or a different vSwitch configuration that is not con uh, consistent, then you may actually get a failure of a vMotion or a virtual machine may fail to restart when it's brought up by HR on a different host because the VMX file that configures that virtual machine refers to specific port group names or specific virtual network configuration items and if they are not available on all the hosts in the cluster, 
then all of the hosts in the cluster will not be able to run that virtual machine. When Now, another issue you'll, fit, you'll see here is that in order for a virtual machine on host 1 to talk to a virtual machine on host 2, there needs to be a configuration, and we'll get into a little bit more detail of this configuration in a moment, that allows the traffic from, you know, let's look at this virtual machine here, the first virtual machine on host 1, to travel down into the virtual switch, out through one of the physical switches, uh, the virtual NIC ports, sorry, physical NIC ports, across a physical switching layer which sits underneath this, back up to a physical switch port on the, another host, and then up to the application in, in the virtual machine. And that configuration must be made so that there is an uplink for the, the VLAN that this virtual machine talks to, must be passed, must be consistent across both the virtual machines, and that virtual LAN, or the VLAN, must be passed out through, and attached to one of these physical NICs, and attached to one of these physical NICs. If any of those configuration items are not there, then the virtual machines will not be able to talk to each other. If we look then at how you might deploy your virtual standard switch, V network switch, uh, standard switches, so one way you could do this on a single host is to have a single virtual switch in which you have multiple virtual machine port groups, which are these port groups at the top, or these v, uh, the VM kernel ports. So the production and test dev are, are your virtual machine port groups. Your management, your vMotion, and your iSCSI, and I mentioned that earlier, are VM kernel port groups, and they are attached to a single virtual switch, which then has four physical switches connected. Uh, someone's asked about the diagram showing VSS0 for all the hosts. Basically, VSS, vNetwork standard switch, and each switch number, each switch has a number. Switch zero, switch one. They don't need to be consistent across virtual machine uh, across hosts. The virtual port group names need to be. In general, when you're managing them, it makes more sense for ease of human brain that they are named consistently, so that you know that a port group called production on virtual switch zero on host one is also called production on a virtual switch zero on host two. It just makes it easier if all of those things are consistent. Just give me a moment guys, I'm about to cough. Sorry for that. Okay, so the other option, or one of the other options, and there are some halfway houses between this, is that you could create a virtual switch for each one of these port groups. So you could create a virtual switch for management, which is linked to two of your physical ports. You could create a virtual switch for vMotion, which is another VM kernel operation linked to two ports. Now these ports can overlap. So you'll see at the top there's only four ports. Down the bottom we've got ten, but you'll actually find that these now, in general, you can only attach a physical NIC to, to a, a single virtual switch, um, but in, in the interest of this, this slide, what it's showing is that you can configure a virtual switch with multiple uplinks for a single functionality. Okay, so then we look at what are the differences between a vNetwork standard switch and a distributed switch. So vNetworks distributor switches are a feature of vCenter, not ESXi. Okay, so you cannot run a, a vNetwork distributor switch or a VDS switch on standalone ESXi. Now, one of the things that means is that you cannot configure a vNetwork distributor switch without vCenter running. You cannot create nor change the configuration unless you are connected to vCenter. So, if you're having a problem with your networks that is causing a problem for vCenter, you may have a problem. It's, it's one of those chicken and egg situations sometimes where if a, a distributed vSwitch issue is causing your vCenter to fail, then you can't actually go and change the configuration. And one of the things you'd probably have to go and do then 
is go and create standard switches on each of your hosts and move your virtual machines manually onto them in order to uh, get networking up and running. One of the benefits though of a distributed uh, switch, a uh, vNetwork switch, is that you get a consistent configuration across multiple hosts in a cluster. You create one distributed vSwitch and you apply it to multiple hosts, that configuration is consistent across them all. The benefit of this, and I mentioned it earlier, is this makes it really easy to ensure that your vMotion um, operations, your HA operations will work because you know that each host is talking to a vSwitch which has port group A, port group B, port group C. And it's always consistent because they're centrally configured. Now, on a distributed uh, vNetwork switch, configuration of policy can be done at the port level. This is different. I mentioned on a vNetwork standard switch, it was done at the port group level. On a distributed vSwitch, you can do it on the port level. You get some additional features though as well with a VDS. So you get network IO control. This gives you the ability during contention, network load or significant load or contention where you've got more traffic trying to get through your network than your network can actually carry to provide priority. So you will have workloads that is absolutely critical that their network traffic gets out and gets out on, on, in a timely manner. You can give them a higher level priority over, and that might be some of your production net workloads say a, a production SQL server, and you may give that a higher priority than traffic coming out of a dev test environment. And what happens then is that if you've got a 10 gig network port and you're sending or trying to send 12 gig of traffic into that port, then the distributed vSwitch will ensure that the traffic from your production SQL server does get out and that it's not the, the, the workload that ends up having network ground traffic dropped. You can also do what they call load-based teaming. Now with some of the algorithms that are used to determine the path that is taken between virtual NICs and physical NICs, there is a one-to-one -one mapping done when the first piece of traffic leaves the virtual machine that basically locks that virtual NIC to a physical NIC come hell or high water. With load-based teaming, once traffic through a physical NIC reaches about 75% of capacity, the load-based teaming functionality is able to break those configuration bonds that were formed and actually change them. So if you had two physical NICs on a host and you had one virtual machine that was punching all its data out through, host, through physical uh, NIC 1, and that physical NIC became severely contended, get, got above 75% utilization, which is pretty much uh, the, the limits in, in Ethernet in, in practical terms, then the bond between the NIC in the virtual machine and physical NIC 1 would be broken and re-established with physical NIC 2, which you would hope had less traffic running through it. Inbound traffic control. So there is some traffic control on standard vNetwork switches, but it is outbound only. So as the traffic leaves the virtual machine, the traffic, and, and so outbound from the virtual machine, so as the traffic leaves, it is policed. So if a virtual machine tries to send more traffic than you've told it it's allowed to, the, the traffic is held back. It, it's blocked. And you know, frames will be dropped or held and pushed out in, in quieter periods. With a vNetwork distributed switch, you also get inbound control as well. So that gives you the ability to control traffic flow in both directions. That can be important depending on what kind of workloads you have and what their traffic profiles are. You also get support for LLDP. So this allows your distributed vSwitches to see neighboring devices and, and vice versa. LLDP link layer discovery protocol, it's a way for network devices, switches, primarily to talk to each other and establish their models, functionalities, features, port speeds, things like that, and exchange information with each other so you can build a network that understands itself. So that is support, LLDP is supported on vNetwork distributed switches. On vNetwork standard switches, there is support for CDP or the Cisco Discovery Protocol, provides a lot less information, a lot less intelligence. There is support for port mirroring. So what port mirroring is, is that you decide that you want one 
port on a, on a switch to see all the traffic that another port sees. Generally, switches don't work that way. Generally, on a, a, a switch, traffic is directed only to the port that is destined to receive that traffic. Other ports on the switch don't see it. So there's a functionality called port mirroring, which allows you to actually send, you know, if you've got traffic destined for port one, you also send it to port four, as an example. The reason you do that sometimes is to monitor traffic. You may want to see what sort of traffic is going to and from a network port, um, and you don't want to do that on the, the, the device that is receiving that traffic natively, because you don't want to install uh, additional applications for monitoring onto the, the, the production workload. So what you'll do is you'll monitor the, uh, a mirrored port with another application, something like e uh, Ethereal or Wireshark. And you also, now, you need vSphere Enterprise Plus for distributed vSwitches. It is one of the key features of the Enterprise Plus licensing package. Uh, it is one of the reasons the Enterprise Plus licensing package is as expensive as it is. Uh, there's some other functionalities included as well, but certainly the Enterprise Plus package is aimed at larger environments, and it is in larger environments that some of these functionalities and features that I'm talking about become most useful. Now, I will just go through some questions very quickly. Uh, so someone has asked if their server yeah, has... Yeah, got quite good yeah. ones. If their server has two NICs, can they split the NIC interfaces into two separate vSwitches? Yes, you can. Absolutely. I'm just going to quickly scroll through these questions. Okay. I've answered that one. I've answered that one. So just working on the red ones. Okay. Do we need to bind iSCSI VMK ports with a host? Yes. And we will touch on iSCSI VMK bindings when we do storage, which is next week, I believe. Uh, when you create a VDS, why does it show up across the data stores? It will show up across all the VMs. I'm not sure why we show up across data stores. Uh, so not across all your VMs, sorry, or across, across all your hosts. Uh, your data stores, there may be files stored on each of the virtual hosts that, that allow them to track the, the VDS configuration. That might be what you're talking about. Host profiles, yes, they can make them consistent. Um, and, and certainly, again, host profiles, however, only come in on higher level licenses. Now, one of the advantages you get out of a V-distributed switch that I, I haven't specifically gone into here yet is that on a standard switch, in order for a VM on one standard switch to talk to a VM on another standard switch, you need to have uplink ports explicitly configured that talk to the VLANs in which the port groups in which those ports you want to talk are configured. Again, you need to be able to, to, to join the dots between the virtual port, the port group, the VLAN, your physical network, and back into your virtual machines again. On a V-distributed switch, you can actually do that without requiring to, that you specifically link physical NICs to the port groups. Now, I will get into that in a moment because I'll start going to some of the configuration options on distributed V-switches. So just, just a couple of follow-up points. Uh, Reginald's come back here was the, the fellow that asked uh, about the VDS and the data stores. Um, he, he sent in that, yes, there were files, and he thought it was a bit odd since it was controlled by vCenter. Yeah, vCenter needs to store that data somewhere, and vCenter will create configurations and tell the host to take those configurations, but yeah, if vCenter goes down, you don't want your vDistributed switch to fail and all your workloads to be out. So what happens is each of the virtual hosts will store some of the configuration information so that they know how to operate with vCenter offline. And that will be where those files are coming from. Uh, Duncan has, uh, so has asked, is it best practice to have vCenter not connected to a distributed vSwitch for management? I'm not sure if it's best practice. Uh, generally, v distributed vSwitches are pretty resilient. Um, it's probably an edge case, what I was mentioning earlier. Uh, I, I don't believe that, that you would consider that to be best practice to use standard vSwitches for that. However, you know, it, it, it depends, I guess, how much effort you want to spend protecting against uh, a, an incident type which is not terribly likely. Someone has asked, would I say that the distributed vSwitches is the preferred standard for enterprise production environments in general compared to standard switches? 
look, if you're paying for the Enterprise Plus license, use the VDSs, use them. There's some, you know, these benefits that I mentioned right here don't come on standard switches. And if you're in a large environment and you have access to the license, use them, absolutely. You know, you're paying for them because you get better functionality out of them. I would absolutely be looking at doing that. A question, can you configure load balance teaming in a round, round robin format? There is some stuff that you can do in a, in that, that fashion, yes. Um, we'll get to some of that in, in a moment, but certainly when you look at, at load balancing and, and NIC teaming, you get to determine uh, what the failover order is for your port switches, uh, so your physical NIC ports, and what algorithm is used to determine which ports the traffic travels through. Certainly if one port fails, so if virtual machine 1 is locked to physical NIC 1 and physical NIC 1 drops, then that virtual machine will be, that path will be recalculated and reformed. Port mirroring is done on a per port basis uh, on a distributed vSwitch. The question was, with port mirroring, is that applied to a port group? No, that's something you would do on a per port basis on a distributed vSwitch, which allows you per port configuration options. As usual, we've got a, a ton of questions flooding in. I'll, I'll just ask one more of you, Robert. Um, yep. This is concerning the labs. This is from Gordon, uh, who guesses it would be hard for the labs to configure a VDS as it requires net infrastructure. Is it, is it too detailed for the labs, or should we yes. step in the play? Yes, we'll go into labs later. Look, if you've got access to the environments at work or somewhere else, then great, go for your life and do it. It would be pretty hard to configure a distributed vSwitch on the labs unless you can manage to get yourself up a second ESXi host. Um, certainly the 60-day trial of vCenter you have is Enterprise Plus licensing. So you have access to the functionality. If you have the capacity to bring up enough infrastructure to test it, go ahead, play with it, learn it, have some fun. Um, I don't expect that people will actually get to that level in the labs. It, it's just getting a bit um, too complex and large. All right. Um, on that note, guys, I will move on. Again, guys watching questions for me and flagging the ones that yeah. you should chase. So I, yeah, I, might, I might just clear off. I might just clear off the ones that we've had so far because cool. we've, we've still got you know another dozen or two. If if it's a really important question, you guys, or if it doesn't sort of get answered in the next couple of slides, we'll feel free to ask it again, and I'll I'll, I'll yep. reflag it. No worries. Okay, so so they're the differences between a, a V network distributed switch and a standard switch. Uh, they're mentioned in the slide there. Uh, just as a hint, there's a quiz question on that particular topic. Okay, so the way a V-network distributed switch might look in your environment and what you'll actually notice here, this is actually a hybrid diagram. Each virtual host has a standard switch configured, but they also have the VDS configured. So what the VDS allows us to do, and, and you'll you notice that the VM kernel ports in this case are all connected to standard switches because again at that point you're looking at what does the host itself need to do in order to operate versus what do your virtual machines need to do. Now in general uh, there is probably less interoperability between your hosts except in the examples of a vMotion event um, in terms of network traffic that they need to send between each other versus things they do uh, for other purposes. You know iSCSI is done between your virtual hosts and your storage provider your management traffic tends to flow between your vCenter servers and your ASXi hosts, not from one host to another. So in this example, what the person who's configuring it has decided to do is they've, they've, they've configured all their virtual machine port groups in a distributed vSwitch so that you get consistency. And again, you get those benefits that I mentioned earlier, such as, as the fact that you know that the port group names exist on every single host consistently. So operations such as vMotion will, will not fail because there's a misconfiguration or an inconsistency. It is absolutely possible, and one thing that's not mentioned here, and I'll get to it now, is that you can create a distributed vSwitch, and you might have a VDS1 here in this case, that has no physical uplinks. Now, what will happen in that case is traffic between the hosts will travel through VM kernel ports. So you can actually have an application on host 1 and host 2 on a distributed vSwitch which has no physical uplinks, but they can still talk to each other. It's one of the little vagaries that you get with distributed vSwitches. You need to be careful with things like that, noting that you're sending additional traffic through ports, that you, uh, your VM kernel ports, that you didn't initially 
necessarily mean to have there. And you just need to be cautious that you don't start flooding uh, network networks. Now, I would not ever do that, incidentally. Uh, I think you're asking for trouble. I think it, you're always much better to have your your, your networks configured. You know, if you're running a v, uh, distributed vSwitch, it should have uplinks. Now, you can create the distributed vSwitch and then create add uplinks to it later or remove them later, but certainly I, I would be looking at having you know, your uplinks con connected so that your switches, your vSwitches and your workloads attached to them can actually talk across the network where you expect them to do so. Let's do a quick check on questions. No, I don't seem to have any more. Sorry, Guy, are you marking them as red, the ones I should be looking at? Or green? Yes, that's right. There's one at the moment. We've got um, what is along from the VMK again for Richard. It's VM kernel, correct? VM kernel, yes. VMK is a VM kernel port. So again, it's a, a port that is used by ESXi itself for its own operations rather than for supporting operations of a virtual machine. And and George has asked, um, in that case, are the VM VLANs on the VDS tunneled or encapsulated via the network of the management network VLAN? Yeah, I, I, having not actually done it in practice, I believe that is the case, yes. Um, it's not something I would recommend. Um, or And I don't think, I think you'd probably find it's not supported that if you were to call VMware and say, hey, I've done this, why doesn't it work? They'd say, well, because you should use physical NICs. Is my understanding. Okay. I'll, I'll take that one on notice. I, I may provide an update on, to that in the forums. It was one of those edge cases that, you know, while I was doing some, some reading to make sure I was up to date on this, that I saw some examples of that kind of configuration noted by people as possible. I've never actually seen it done in practice, and I would not recommend it. Okay. Um, and then we've just got a suggestion in from Andrew um, for being able to tinker with distributed vSwitches. Um, uh, nesting virtualization only need one host with the relevant CPU support. Any? Yeah, so certainly you, you, can, you have one physical host and then you have multiple virtual ESXi hosts, yes. But what you're looking at then is, is do you have the resources available on your machine to do it? Now you can, in theory, create a VDS that only spans one virtual host. Uh, you would get some of those additional benefits that I mentioned before, uh, but you would not get the primary benefit, which is the fact that you've got a configuration which, which is consistent across multiple hosts and, and allows you to configure in one place and apply that configuration in multiple places consistently and immediately. Um, as was mentioned by somebody earlier, yes, host profiles help with that to a degree, but you don't get a lot of the functionality. Okay, and uh, one more from Muhammad, and then we'll move on. I think, um, is it better to mix standard and distributed switches? For example, use standard switches for iSCSI and distributed switches for VM traffic and other traffic? Again, what you want to look at is what are the benefits you get out of a distributed vSwitch, and do those benefits apply to the, the kind of workload you're applying them to? So would you want to port mirror your, your iSCSI? Are you looking for LLDP functionality? Um, and generally the answer to that is probably no. And again, given that you know, one of the primary benefits of, of your VDS is the ability to have consistent traffic between hosts, then a standard switch is probably appropriate for something like iSCSI, simply because you, you, it's actually for VM kernel ports anyway. And your VM kernel, as I, as I mentioned, is, is used by ESXi itself, and, and really there's not a lot of information sharing between those, those hosts for the kind of traffic you'd run over VM kernel. So, so I would say, in general, again, the way I have done it in the past, the way I have seen it done in the past, and certainly the way it was in that example I used there, was that the VM kernel stuff was generally kept on standard switches, and the VDS stuff was then used for your virtual machine port groups. However, vMotion traffic, as an example, might be something you might want to push over a VDS. So in the end, look at the functionalities you get out of the switch, the virtual switch types and determine which one of them is most appropriate for the workload you're considering is, is probably the answer, which is a, an answer saying that I'm not going to give you a direct an uh, or a concrete answer <laughs> because there isn't one. You know, uh, how long is a piece of string? Well, it's doubled the length from the middle to the end. Um, you know, it, each environment is slightly different. Each environment, it also depends on what's your supporting or your underlying physical infrastructure. 
Um, and, and again, you know, if you've got Enterprise Plus, then make use of the functionality where it suits. One thing I would suggest is that the KISS principle is uh, valid in some places where you use the simplest configuration possible. Beauty. Uh, well, we might keep the, uh, got another couple, but we might keep yep. them for the longer, no, longer questions at the end. No worries. Okay, so moving on. So advanced settings. So there are a, a set, when you configure your virtual switches, and we're going to stay largely on the standard switches here. Uh, VDS switches are probably a little bit beyond the scope of what we can really get to with A, home labs, and B, with only an hour on virtual networking. Uh, certainly, I, I, when I run the master's level course, we spend a lot more time on the subject of networking and some of these options. But when you look at the functionalities that are available to you in the configuration of your virtual switches versus where you configure the port groups. Now, some of the configuration options can be done at either level or both levels. So the MTU is an example, so the maximum transition unit, which is the largest frame that will be transmitted by the switch, or the virtual switch in this case, without breaking it up. So in general, standard Ethernet is around 1500 bytes. If you are using jumbo frames for something like iSCSI, you might want to push that up to 9000. Now one thing when configuring MTU, and I'll get to this, I, I talk about this further, on is that the closer you are to your workload, so the the more important it is that your MTU is no larger than the the, the path along you know, between the workload and, and its destination. So if you're talking about iSCSI traffic, that at, when you configure your VM kernel port or your VM kernel port group for iSCSI and you set the MTU, you need to ensure that it is no larger than the physical infrastructure that underlies it, which includes your physical switches and also your your storage target, your, your iSCSI storage provider. Because if any of those are using a smaller MTU than you configure the host for, what will happen is that your host will push a large pack or a large frame down the network and that frame will fail to pass. And it will fail and Failures of network traffic are, are, tend to be rather spectacular in that things just stop working. But you can configure an MTU at both the network switch layer and the port group layer. And again, this is important, is that you cannot create or successfully configure a port group with a MTU larger than the, port, than the MTU of the switch. Again, you're looking at the, the closer you are to the end point of the transmission, and that's whether it's transmit or receive, then it, the, the MTU needs to be smaller than the path along the way. So if your V network switch is configured for a 1500 MTU and you try to configure a port group with a 9000 MTU, yes, the configuration will apply, but no, it will not work. And this is important. And as you, you go through some of these other functionalities, MTU is probably the exception that most of them, the most specific configuration applies successfully. So the port group configuration will generally override the switch configuration, except for MTU. So when you look at link discovery, so this is whether you can do CDP basically on a, on a standard port switch. That's configured at the switch level, but if you look at the port group configuration, there's actually no option for it because it's the switch functionality. The VLAN ID is the opposite. The switch doesn't care which VLANs are on it because you configure them at the port group and the switch simply applies them all. So when you configure the VLAN ID, you do that at the port group level. The same as you would effectively on a physical switch is you don't tell the switch, I want the switch to be VLAN 1. Well, VLAN 1 is a bad one because it's the default one. Uh, you, might, you don't tell the switch, I want to be VLAN 10. You tell the switch, go configure your ports to be in VLAN 10. There's an important difference there because the switch itself doesn't actually generally participate in network traffic. The, the ports themselves, though, need to be in the correct VLAN in order to connect to the correct layer 2 network domain. Uplink configuration, including teaming of network cards, so your physical NIC ports, are teamed to both a V network switch and also a port group. This is one of those examples, again, where you need to ensure that when you configure your port group that you are, well, you, the only options you get in a port group that is on a particular switch 
are the physical ports that are connected to that switch but you can create or you can configure a subset for a port group. So if you have a vSwitch 1 as, a, as an example and you have port groups A and B and you have physical NICs 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now if you put all four of those physical NICs into and you create them as uplinks on vSwitch 1 then when you create your port groups, each one of those port groups will have the, the ability to talk to those physical NIC ports. You can configure that you talk to all of them or only a subset of them. So you may decide that in port group 1 or port group A, you are only going to put send traffic from that port group through physical NICs 1 and 2. And you may decide that for port group B, you will only send that traffic through, port, through the physical NICs 3 and 4. This way you can separate your traffic. So you can decide that certain traffic goes out certain physical paths. Security options can be configured at the switch layer and also the port group layer. And we'll get to what some of those configure is. We'll go through what these options are as we go through here. But certainly you can tell the switch that by default certain security options should be set. But then you can override those options at the port group layer. You can do the same with traffic shaping. So you can set on the switch that as a general rule for the switch that certain traffic speeds, uh, so your, your uh, average bandwidth, your peak bandwidth and your burst size or burst shape are configured to a, a general setting uh, and by default all your port groups will pick those settings up but you can override them on a per port group level. Now we will just go through and I'll just see, I don't think I'm actually seeing the questions updating unfortunately. Guy, I'm seeing, I don't have any red ones at all. So I don't think it's up. It's updated. No, there's a there's a couple of yellow ones. Um, yep. There's there's a bit quiet on the on the question front. No. Okay. Good. All right. We'll keep going then. Just want to be sure. Okay. So as I mentioned before, so you can define the maximum MTU that a virtual switch will allow. This is commonly used for iSCSI to provide enhanced throughput, and it's generally the the, the most common area that you want you, you'll see this used. And this is where I mentioned your push jumbo frames, which allow you to carry a little bit more payload for each header and footer on a frame. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it must be equal or less than the physical network path MTU to prevent issues. So if you set a larger MTU at the endpoint than is possible to pass through the entire network path between source and destination, you will end up with problems. Sorry, I just lost my screen there for a moment. Okay, another option that you can set is link discovery. And as I mentioned before, this is using the Cisco discovery protocol. The functionalities that you allow your, your virtual switches to do, they can listen to CDP information so that your virtual switches learn what physical switches are around them. It has to be Cisco or switches that talk CDP. You can advertise. So you can broadcast from your virtual switches into your physical network domain what capabilities at a basic level your virtual switches have, how many ports they have, what VLANs they're operating, things like that. You can do both, you can listen and advertise, or you can do none. Now, in general, if you're not actively using CDP on your network, turn it off. Because if you're not actively using it on any of your other network devices, there's no point having it on. And what you're doing is you're introducing additional workload on your virtual switches and also a little bit more network traffic flowing out through your networks. It's not a lot of network traffic, but you know, it, again, going back to the KISS principle, if you're not actively using the functionality, turn it off. If you don't know whether you're using it or not, chances are you're not. Turn it off. It's there. Uh, generally, if you're going to start doing that, you're going to be looking at more enhanced functionality and you're probably looking at your vNetwork distributed switches. Now the security settings, and I mentioned these earlier, and these can be set on the switch and the port group level. So promiscuous mode. So in general, on a virtual switch, now I mentioned before that a switch's job is to forward network frames from one MAC address to another. The way that switches do this is that they have what they call a MAC address table or an ARP table, which defines which port a particular MAC address has been seen on. And so if the virtual switch receives a frame that is destined for a particular MAC address, 
then it knows which virtual port that it should send that frame to and only delivers it to that port. However, if you set a port group or the switch into promiscuous mode, what this does is it allows any traffic to come in to be sent to all of the ports in that port group or on that switch. This can be useful if you want to, again, do some network monitoring without having access to a distributed vSwitch, where you might have a port group of only a couple of ports. You say that all traffic that comes into that virtual switch should be sent to all ports, and what that means is your monitoring machine that talks to one of those virtual machine ports in the port group is able to collect all of the traffic that comes into that network. That can be useful uh, in a DMZ as an example if you want to be looking at uh, seeing what sort of traffic is entering and leaving your DMZ without putting monitoring onto each of the actual workloads in, the, in, in that network. Excuse me, I'm about to cough again. I don't wish to do that on the microphone. I apologise. This is a good opportunity. That's a good opportunity to say we've got a few questions coming in oh, again. Yep, cool. Let me see. Uh, Dan, Dan Chi has just asked about promiscuous mode, which is handy. Um, uh, is promiscuous mode like the poor man's option for port mirroring? Yes, yes. It, it can be used to achieve that. That's correct. Um, so, yeah, within that port group. Now, port mirroring means that you forward traffic from one port to another port. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me, my cough. Promiscuous mode means you forward any traffic destined into a port group or a switch to every port in that port group or switch. Uh, it's something you would use with caution because, again, if a virtual machine with its virtual NIC receives a, a frame, it has to identify, should I pay attention to this frame or not? And it takes CPU cycles to do that. So if you've got a very busy network and you've got a, a workload that doesn't need to see 80% of the traffic, what that means is it's processing 80% of the traffic it doesn't need to pay attention to. And, and that does have an impact, especially in virtualization, where one of the things you're trying to do is reduce the extra work that any workload does so that you can oversubscribe your environment. Um, why, so there's been a question, why would you configure multiple port groups on a switch instead of, ha instead of having separate switches for simplicity uh, is one of the reasons. It also means that, so if I, if I have four physical NICs in my host and I create one virtual switch and I put all my port groups onto that switch, I can effectively balance or, or uh, send traffic from all those port groups through all four of those ports. So if one of them fails, I've still got three spares, three that are working, and I can balance the traffic across them. If I create smaller V switches, say I create two V switches and each one of them has two uplink ports, then I've only got, for each one of those virtual switches, two possible ports that I can send the traffic through. And what that means is that I don't get to utilize a, a, as much all four ports. If I've got two of those ports are very busy, two of those port groups are very busy, and they're on one virtual switch, and the other virtual switch has two port groups that aren't very busy at all, then what can happen is that two of your physical NIC ports are very busy and the other two are underutilized. So by using one big V switch with all four ports, you can better balance your traffic across your NIC ports. However, sometimes there are reasons why you would not do that. Um, security is one of them. I certainly, for DMZs, create a separate V switch with completely separate uplink ports. Uh, we treat them very, very differently. There are some edge case vulnerabilities that exist uh, around VLAN jumping that that could potentially, if you were to share a vSwitch with DMZ and uh, internal corporate network traffic, allow traffic to, to move across them. There are exploits in the wild, or have been exploits in the wild at various times to achieve that. That's certainly one of the areas where I would absolutely recommend that you create separate vSwitches for certain traffic types. And again, that's probably a good rule of thumb that you, you don't want to mix levels of trustworthiness of network traffic onto a single vSwitch. And you probably wouldn't do the same on a physical switch either. You probably don't run your DMZ on the same network switch as you run your internal uh, corporate LAN on. You probably run them on separate physical switches just to provide that extra layer of security.
uh, there's been a question if traffic shaping is configured on the vSwitch, but the server NIC sends lots of traffic, will it queue the traffic or drop those packets? Uh, again, noting that we're talking frames, not packets, because packets are a layer three uh, thing. Uh, what would happen is that they would start filling buffers, and if those buffers get full, they get dropped. There is no auto, so somebody's asked, would it not be better to leave the MTU settings as auto? There is no auto setting for MTU. You must define, now there is a standard of 1500, and yes, that probably ensures that your vSwitch MTU or your port group MTU is not causing a network problem. However, there are times such as, as I mentioned before, when you're running iSCSI, if you're running fairly heavy levels of iSCSI traffic, then you probably want to use 9000 and the reason for that is this, I'll go into it now, is that if you have a 1500 byte frame, then every frame has a header and a footer and in that the header and footer is various pieces of information about where the, the traffic is destined, where it's come from, there's some other information in there as well and there's a footer that basically says right this is the end of the frame, right, that's to, to give a very high level summary. Now if you've got a 1500 byte frame, let's say for the sake of argument, and, and this is, they're, they're not this big, but you'll get why I say this in a minute, that 400 bytes, so if it's 1500 bytes, the frame, if 400 bytes is the header and 100 bytes is the footer, then you've only got 1000 bytes of actual payload for every frame. And there's an overhead on your network to transmitting each frame. So in a 1500 byte frame, only two thirds of my traffic is actually payload. If I expand to a 9000 byte frame, the, head, the heading, the header and the footer stay the same size, 500 bytes between the two of them. But that's only 500 bytes out of 9,000. What that means is I've got 8,500 bytes of payload for that frame. And what that means is the percentage of my network traffic that is actually payload versus header and footer is much higher. And what that ultimately leads to, assuming that all your network devices are capable of dealing with jumbo frames, is that you get higher levels of throughput. When you're running iSCSI behind transactional SQL databases, uh, especially if you're doing online transactional work, then every byte of throughput counts. And that would be one of the reasons why you would use jumbo frames. Uh, if someone's asked, if PNICs are teamed, do the ports they are connected to on the physical switch need to be trunked? No. Uh, and in fact, I'll get that to in a minute. Trunking or uh, LACP, is not supported on standard switches, standard via uh, network switches. And so you actually need to do some specific configuration options around some of the algorithms for load balancing that you need to use to ensure that you don't confuse your switches. You do not form lags or LACP groups on your switches when talking to standard V network switches. Why would you use forged transmits? Um, troubleshooting, generally. Uh, some very specific troubleshooting that again if you don't know why you probably don't need to turn it on um, but basically oh no, that's not necessarily true actually you, you may use it for Windows load balancing or what they call network load balancing NLB or now they call Windows fabric um, so with forward transmits turned off a virtual switch won't accept a frame from a virtual machine that doesn't have the MAC address that the virtual machine is configured for as its source. However, if you're running two virtual machines and a virtual uh, MAC across the two of them, then with forward transmits turned off, that would not be allowed. So what would happen is the frame would be sent with the virtual MAC address and the virtual switch would say, that doesn't match the virtual machine configuration in the VMX file, I'm dropping that, I'm not going to pass it. So that's one of the reasons you might use it. Uh, certainly promiscuous mode is used for that reason as well, to allow it to accept packets for, or sorry, frames, I've done it myself, um, to allow the virtual machine to accept frames that are not destined for the MAC address which is configured in the VMX file. Uh, would you put kernel traffic on a separate PNIC? It depends, is the answer there. Uh, my environments that I deal with every day have 10 gig physical NICs and they have multiple uh, 10 gig NICs and I use a combination of traffic shaping and over subscription in order to not separate my VM kernel traffic from my other traffic. Uh, how does VMware create a MAC address? It is configured in the VMX file 
for the virtual machine. If you vMotion a, a virtual machine from one uh, host to another, the MAC address actually changes, which can be a bit fun. Sometimes you have to physically go and do it. Um, is there a possibility of MAC addresses to be duplicated accidentally? There is a very, very, very low likelihood of that occurring, but in theory, yes, it could occur. Uh, if you're aware of the way MAC addresses are built, the first half of the MAC address is owned by the vendor, is the vendor identification, and the second half is then uh, the actual part of it that changes. So every Intel NIC will have the same first half of its MAC address. Every Broadcom NIC will have the same, the first half of the MAC address will be the same. It's the second half that changes. Um, yeah, in theory, it is possible that you would see duplication. It's certainly globally you would probably see it, but in a particular environment, because MAC addresses don't tend to pass beyond routed borders or routed boundaries, it doesn't matter that if uh, a network in the UK has a MAC address and an unrelated network in Australia has the same MAC address, it probably doesn't matter. Happens in the in the physical world too. Uh, some of the cheaper network providers have reused MAC addresses, and I have actually seen that cause problems. Sorry, I know some more questions here. I keep losing them. Um, so VM one and VM two are on the same V switch on the same host. Uh, would traffic between them leave the? And it's scrolling out on me. Okay, leave switch onto the physical network and come back. No, it does not leave. So one of the benefits of a V switch is that traffic between virtual machines on that V switch stays inside the V switch, and it's technically passed at memory speed of the host. So because it doesn't have to go to wire, it doesn't have to drop to wire speed. Um, it's limited then in general by the speed of the virtual NIC. Uh, if you're using VMX Net three, they are 10 gig capable. Uh, Still a few questions up, up there, Robert, but um, maybe we'll get to the end of the course. We've got a, oh, sorry, the, the lecture, we've got maybe two or three more slides, yep. and then we've got a question slide, so we'll save it up for them, folks. Cool, sounds good, and we're oh, well, nine o'clock, so yeah, we're, we're almost done anyway. So, oh, sorry, I'll just go back. We talked about forged transmits, and basically allows a virtual machine to send packets onto the network with a source MAC address other than that's the, the MAC address that's configured in the VMX. And again, these security settings can be configured on a per switch basis, but also on a per, per port group basis. Generally, I would expect you would configure these on the port group. Generally, that's generally where you'll see that. The more specific configuration wins. So if the switch is configured for it, all the port groups on the switch will have it automatically, but you can go and change the setting on a per port group basis if you explicitly set the, the policy. So we talked uh, some questions earlier about NIC, balance, uh, NIC teaming and, and load balancing. So what this allows you to do is connect multiple physical NICs, or PNICs, I mentioned that before, to a virtual switch. Now you, and this next logical groupings of virtual ports does not belong here. Sorry, it belongs under the next port, which is your uh, and this slide is broken, I am terribly sorry. I will go through this very briefly. So, I will get the slide changed and updated. So, sorry for the confusion. So, what this allows you to do, as I mentioned, is to have multiple physical NICs assigned to a virtual switch. You can then decide on a per port group basis which of those physical NICs you will pick up and utilize, and even whether you want to use them in a, a load balanced or a failover capability. So you can have multiple active physical NICs, or you can have one active physical NIC and then a number of backup or failover physical NICs. Now there are a number of algorithms that are used to determine how the traffic is passed. And they are by the hash of the source and destination IP address, which is where one of the few layer three operations that actually affect a layer two uh, a, a vSwitch. You can do it by the originating port ID, so basically, and this is where I mentioned earlier, where a, when a packet leaves a virtual NIC for the first time, after the VM is turned on, it is assigned, that a path is assigned between that virtual NIC and a physical NIC, and that is kept basically until there is a, a reason to change it. 
Um, you can do it based on so IP hash. You can do it on hash of the MAC address, which I think is the source MAC address, which again tends to largely tie a virtual port to a physical port. You can do it by hash of the IP addresses. You can do it by originating port. And I can't off the top of my head remember the last one. Generally, though, however, let me just check if my next slide goes into this. There, there they are. Explicit failover order. Sorry, is the other one. So you can actually say this is the failover order I want to use. Okay, so I do apologise for that previous slide. It was a bit broken. So when using the, the NIC balancing, as I mentioned, you have to use one of these load balancing algorithms. You need to be careful with that option and the next option which is your network failover detection. So this is how does the virtual switch detect that a physical uplink has failed and then what will it do about it based on the load balancing algorithms. You don't want to use route based on IP hash and beacon probing together, it will fail, it will cause you problems. So link status only is basically is the physical link up. Beacon probing is a little bit different where it actually sends packets out on the network and wants to see, uh, can it see paths between physical NIC ports uh, across the physical network using those beacons. So it pushes a beacon out onto the physical network and sees it or receives it down other ports. Um, it is a more resilient uh, or a quicker failover detection option. So it will pick up changes in network configurations and will actually detect incorrect virtual switch configurations for you and tell you about that. However, it will break route based on IP hash. And when you are, you know, we talked about trunking earlier. So when you are aggregating multiple physical ports into a virtual switch in general, the algorithm you'll use uh, is the route based on IP hash. There are reasons to use the other algorithms and they will be situation dependent. But certainly if you're using route based on IP hash, you should not use beacon probing as your failover detection option because you will cause your network to fail. Um, in general, again, if you have a good physical switch configuration and you are doing a sensible virtual network switch configuration, then link status is probably the best way to do it. If the link is physically up, then use it. If the link is physically down, then send the traffic somewhere else. Now, the first three of those load balancing algorithms I've put there are generally used when you've got your physical NICs are all in active mode. So if you've got more than one physical NIC attached to a switch, then what this allows you to do is send traffic based on certain calculations out different physical ports. So it's load balancing, effectively trying to use as best you can all of your NICs. You obviously need to make sure that any VLANs that are configured in your port groups that are attached to your physical switch are also configured on the physical switch ports that your physical NICs are connected to. So if you're, you've got a port group that is tagging VLAN 10 and you've got another port group that is tagging VLAN 20 and you are balancing that across three physical NIC ports, then you need to ensure that your physical switches the ports that are connected back to your physical NIC ports on your hosts are ready to accept VLANs 10 and 20 tagged. If they are not configured to accept those VLANs in a tagged fashion, they will simply drop the packet, the frames. I said packets again. The, the traffic will just go wandering, it'll be dropped. Because if, if you set, so you want to set your, your physical ports to be in trunk mode, um, or tagged mode, depending on which network uh, equipment vendor you're using. But certainly, uh, you do not want to be using uh, LACP or static or, or, or uh, static trunks. There's another term that they use in Cisco, um, but it's generally around LACP, the, the link aggregation configuration protocols. You don't want to do that. You effectively want each one of your physical switch ports is connected into your virtual environment to be acting independently. The only real thing you need to look at is whether you are accepting untagged traffic or tagged traffic. Now the, the final option is traffic shaping and this is where I mentioned before. So each one of my hosts has let's say four 10 gig ports 
on it. Now I may decide that I want the majority of my traffic to or to be my iSCSI and virtual machine traffic and I want to actually limit my VM kernel traffic. So I might say that across my my virtual uh, my VM kernel port group that I want to allow only five gig of traffic out of the forty potential gig I have. So what I can do is on my on my virtual machine uh, so VM kernel port group, I can set the average bandwidth, the peak bandwidth, and the burst size. Average bandwidth is basically the amount of bandwidth the the switch group or the the virtual uh, the VM kernel port group will attempt to push down the network in any particular stage. Peak is how much it can push in if it, there's a sudden glut of traffic. If, if suddenly there's a lot more traffic than normal, how much can it push through? And your burst size is when it does decide to go to peak, how much traffic can it push in that peak before it gets throttled back to the average? In general, as I said, if I want to, if I've got you know four 10 gig ports and I want to limit a particular port group to only five gig, I would set the average and the peak bandwidth to both be five gig. What that means is I'm not allowing any bursting, and, and the burst size then is largely irrelevant. Uh, you obviously, if you do allow bursting, you probably want to allow a fair bit of traffic to go through but you don't want to, uh, it, it again becomes an issue of what does your network environment look like, how much burst can you really cope with, and for how long can you cope with it. And these are some configuration options you would set. Again, remembering that in a standard uh, VNetwork standard switch, you can only traffic your shape on, uh, on the outbound traffic out of your virtual NICs. You cannot shape what's coming back into them on a VNetwork distributor switch, you can shape in both directions. You can actually limit the traffic that enters the v uh, the virtual NICs as well. So traffic back into your virtual machines, you can you can uh, you, you can police or shape. Shaping and policing in in this case are the terms used uh, to largely mean the same thing. In some other net, uh, networking environments, they they are a little bit different. Shaping is a soft uh, action where you tend to try to keep things to a certain size, policing is hard, that you cannot go above that size. In this case it is shaping um, because there is no separate policing configuration. Now before we get into any other questions, unless there's any particular questions that we've just gone through just now, let's have a quick look at that to see. No, everything looks okay at the moment. So for your week two labs, what I'd like to see you do is to do some investigation. Um, so have a look at the default configuration that comes once you set up ESXi and vCenter. Have a look at it, have a play with it, see what options are set by default. Then try to create some new networks. So create a new virtual switch, create a new virtual machine port group. Um, how successfully you can do that and, and the, the way you can configure config, uh, your connectivity will depend on the physical environment you have access to. Certainly, once you have a physical NIC assigned to a virtual switch, you cannot assign a separate virtual switch to that same physical NIC. It won't work. Um, so you can't share physical NICs between virtual switches, something I probably hadn't mentioned earlier. But certainly you can create some port groups and have a play. You can create a virtual switch and have two virtual machines and have a virtual switch with no uplinks. So you, you'll get your inter-virtual machine traffic in that case, but you won't be able to talk to the outside world. And try to get two VMs communicating um, across the default VM switch, as I mentioned, on a VM switch with no physical NIC uplinks, so that you can test that, you know, keeping the traffic within the virtual NIC environment, uh, but then also test your VM connectivity to the outside world. Certainly, if you've run up vCenter, and you are using the vSphere client on your workstation to talk to it, you've already tested that. And that's really it for what I'd like to see done in the labs this week. Now, did we have any more questions that I need to get to? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of oranges, good, and some reds, excellent, okay. Okay, I'm finding that Citrix is not sorting these properly, so I'm just going to try to scroll through them and find them for people. Okay, so with NIC teaming, what are the requirements of the external switch? Does need to be Cisco configured for NIC teaming? No. Again, depending on the load balancing algorithm you're using, uh, you want to have your switches acting independently of each other. Don't use LACP. 
Uh, someone has mentioned that Switch has route based on IP hash, which is used for LACP. Um, that is, to my experience and learning, not the case. LACP will break IP hash load balancing. Um, you know, certainly in the environments I'm working in, I've, uh, I've only ever seen trouble when people have tried to configure LACP with standard virtual um, switches. Uh, someone's asked then uh, if we use a route via ha IP hash, I assume this means now, we then use, ba uh, it's based on load, is use, is load balancing a better option? Lee, can you just rephrase that, I'm not quite, uh, certainly basing on, doing your load balancing based on IP hash, I, I find is, is a pretty efficient and fair way of load balancing. Some of the other algorithms can provide better uh, results under certain circumstances um, but yeah in, in general um, you know, IP hash is the one I've found is the best um, there's been a question don't they have to be trunk ports on the physical switches no they don't um, so you don't want to configure them in a lag where you put mult so trunk has some um, multiple meanings depending on who's saying it so when Cisco talk about trunking they talk about aggregating multiple ports into a logical construct and then you have either static or dynamic trunking. Um, so LACP is, is the standard, the open standard uh, for what Cisco call dynamic trunking. Static trunking, um, I, I again, my physical host where I work, you know, I was there today, do not, we do not configure any form of port aggregation on the physical switches. We treat them independently. Uh, Daniel so has asked about a vMotion between hosts may change the MAC address. Yes, that is possible. That can happen because as the, the MAC address is set by the host when the VM is created, um, and when you migrate it, that MAC address can change. Not always, um, I believe, but certainly it can. Um, and it's so just something to be careful of. Now, distributed vSwitches fix that because effectively there's no, the configuration is kept by vCenter and therefore there's only one master for the network information. Uh, question, does vSwitch and vDistributor switches, um, before I finish with this, I know we're out of time in terms of we've run over again. I'm happy to keep answering questions, guys. If you're happy with what you've heard, thank you for attending. Look for the quiz and the uh, the lab work. Uh, but yeah, at, at this stage, I'll keep answering some questions. I don't mind hanging around. So sorry, going back to the question, do vSwitches and distributed switches have any effect on the network where STP and BPDU or... BPDU standing for, and I should know this, it's to do with your bridge, um, your root bridge detection um, algorithm, which are part of STP. Um, no, that they, they, they have no effect on STP or, or BPDU or any of that, that um, banning tree stuff, stuff, sorry, horrible name for what is a very technical term. Um, ordinarily, I know what BPDU stands for, but my mind has just gone blank on it. I know it's to do with spanning tree and, and the packets that get passed around to determine um, where your root bridges are and where the brakes are in the network. I'm waiting for a student to send it in. Surely someone will. <laughs> Bridge protocol data unit. Thank, Thank you, you, George. Yep. It's, it's to do with determining where the root of your, your bridge in your spanning tree protocol sits. Uh, the root being the, the core of the network effectively from a layer 2 perspective uh, as opposed to a layer 3 perspective. Um, I'm looking for more red flags. I'm not seeing any. I'm happy to progress to orange. So I will do that. I've got, I've got a couple at the top here that have yet to be uh, uh, prioritised. Um, from Jerry, we've got... Um, He's asking about the best practice of the network traffic. The I can you put them on a, a single NIC? Yes, you can. Absolutely, you can. Um, it, it, again, a lot of the answers to this is it depends. Um, 
ideally, so your management traffic is actually very small. Right? There's generally not a lot of management traffic. It's vCenter telling your host what to do occasionally. You might SSH into it, which is a tiny amount of traffic. Uh, I share vMotion and management traffic on a single physical port. Best practice is probably not to, just because that way you want to make sure that you know you don't impact on vMotion traffic, and vMotion traffic can be fairly significant. Um, but you know, best practice probably not to share them. In real, in all honesty, in a lot of environments, it won't hurt. Okay, had a couple of questions on the labs as well, um, which I wasn't going to ask, but there's been a few of them. Um, people asking about where to send labs or where, where to report or whether to submit the labs? Um, no, you look, you ha certainly discuss them in the lab forums. Uh, you don't need to submit them. It, it's sort of an honour thing. If you want to learn the stuff, if you want to actually you know, get your hands on some of this stuff, then, then yeah, you, you definitely want to uh, do your labs. It, it's more about your own learning and ensuring that you are, you're understanding what's, what we're going through in the lectures. Um, Jacob, yeah, trunking and, and, and aggregation, um, I may have no, missed up. So, sorry, Robert, just, yep. just before you go on, um, just with, with the forums, we, we do really encourage people to sort of share what they are doing in the labs, in those forums, and sort of say, well, here's how I got around this issue, here's how I got around that issue. Um, we, really, we really do think that those forums are a great uh, avenue for sort of collaborative learning to sort of help each other out. So, so make yep. sure that even if you are just doing the labs by yourself, just say, you know, here's a screenshot of what I've done. Yeah, look, and if you're having problems in the labs, ask either the students or, you know, I, I monitor the forums as well. You know, someone will answer, someone will offer help. And certainly asking pointed questions about things that aren't going well or, or why you're seeing a certain result is a great way to show you're actually doing the labs. Um, so Jacob has mentioned that, that trunking and link aggregation get uh, those terms, I may have mixed those up. Certainly I know that in, in, with other vendors the term trunking tends to mean aggregation and it may be that I, I've confused those things. But generally link aggregation through LACP or LAGs is something you don't want to be doing with standard vSwitches. Uh, I believe it is possible with the DB switches, um, but I won't go into that now here. I'll probably go to a little bit of look, looking at that. I don't use it, just saying. Um, as is more diagrams and sl uh, in the slides, I will see, do what I can. Yep, I, I do understand that. Yes, pictures do often sp uh, speak a thousand words. Can a V network distributed switch be set up for hosts across two separate sites in the same VLAN? In theory, yes. You would want to be careful, however, with that uh, to ensure that you've got layer two connectivity ac across those two sites. Stuart has asked if we have any recommendations for online training and simulation labs after the trial. There's been some comments in the week one lab forums on various tools for that. Um, have a look at those. I will see if I can find anything in particular as well. Just seeing what else is coming, guys. Sorry. I think Citrix hates me. It keeps killing the sword order for me. <laughs> I'll, I'll, read a I'll read a couple out yeah, then. Sure. Uh, we've got one from Jason Hall a few minutes ago. Not sure whether it was answered. Uh, with a DV switch, what are the recommendations around load-based teaming on multiple uploads? Uh, yeah, I, I won't go into that one here. Um, I, I've sort of left distributed V switches out of this particular lecture. I'm happy to answer that question in the forums. Sure. Uh, yeah, so a couple of red ones down there still may have been answered already. Is traffic shaping ACLs? No, traffic shaping is not ACLs. It's literally counting the the, the size of the frames. Uh, oh, look, I say it's not ACLs. I'm thinking of ACLs in a layer three um, context. R really, it's around how much traffic has passed through the port over a particular period of time. 
Um, and this is where you get into that shaping versus policing. ACLs are really policing. It's a hard stop once you reach a, li a limit. This is shaping where it's it's aiming to get to a particular level, but not guaranteeing it. All righty. Well, I think the questions are drying up. We've kept you over time again, so thank you very much, everyone, for sticking around, and thank you, Robert, for for sticking around to answer the questions. Um, uh, I think now would probably be a pretty good time to, to wrap it up for this week and if you do have any questions make sure you, you chuck them in the forums and if you need a hand chuck it in the forum as well um, so yeah for me that's all but uh, yes thanks Robert very much once again for another interesting webinar well thank you guys uh, appreciate it um, next week um, on the webinar we'll try to keep more of time if we possibly can uh, do a little bit of uh, admin stuff as some we'll have a bit of a chat about ITPA very briefly at the end as well and why people may or may not be interested in joining us. Uh, but we won't go through that today because we're already late. So thank you for your time, everybody. Um, thank you for your uh, involvement. The questions are good. I do appreciate seeing them. And feel free to keep asking on the forums, as Guy has mentioned. Thank you all. And we will make sure we get the recording up a little bit earlier this week than we did last week. Okay. Thanks, all. Bye.